information security measures can be classified into organizational, human, physical, and technical measures. Organizational measures include the creation of an internal unit dedicated to information security, along with making InfoSec part of the duties of some staff in every department. Human users can also constitute vulnerabilities in an information system. For example, cyber criminals may manipulate users into sharing sensitive information through social engineering attacks like phishing. Human measures include providing awareness training for users on proper InfoSec practices. Threats can also be physical. Natural disasters such as fires and floods to human-inflicted dangers including theft and vandalism, physical or armed assaults, and even systematic hardware failures are considered threats to a company's information system. Physical measures include controlling access to the office locations. Physical security measures include locks, gates, video security cameras, and security guards. Technical measures can be defined as the measures and controls afforded to systems and any technological aspect of an organization. Technical measures encompass the utilization of hardware, software, and various tools to secure information and information systems. Common examples of technical measures in information security include authentication, digital signatures, anti-malware, firewall, and steganography. Authentication is the process of determining whether someone or something is who or what they say they are. Authentication technology provides access control for systems by checking to see if a user's credentials match the credentials in a database of authorized users. An authentication factor represents a piece of data or attribute that can validate a user requesting access to a system. Some authentication factors currently used include the following. Knowledge factor. The knowledge factor or something you know can be any credential reflecting information the user possesses such as a personal identification number or PIN, username, password or answers to secret security questions. Possession factor. The possession factor or something you have can be a credential involving items the user can own and carry with them, including hardware device, smart card, or mobile phone used to accept a text message or run an authentication app that can generate a one-time password or OTP or PIN. Something you are is typically based on biometric identification such as fingerprints or thumbprints, voice recognition, facial recognition, or a retina scan. For user identity, users are typically identified with a user ID. Authentication occurs when the user provides credentials such as a password that match their user ID. The practice of requiring a user ID and a password is known as Single Factor Authentication or SFA. Organizations have strengthened authentication by asking for additional authentication factors. These can be a unique code provided to a user over a mobile device when a sign-on is attempted such as an OTP or a quick response code or a biometric signature. This is known as two-factor authentication or 2FA. Authentication protocols can go further than 2FA and use multiple factors to authenticate a person or system. Authentication methods that use two or more factors are called multi-factor authentication or MFA. A digital signature is a cryptographic technique used to verify the authenticity, integrity, and origin of a digital message, document, or electronic communication. Here's a simplified overview of how digital signatures work. Signer feeds the data of any size and type to the hash function and generates the hash data or hash value which is a fixed size string of alphanumeric characters. The value of this hash is unique to the data. There is no chance of generating two identical fingerprints. This would happen only if the input documents or files are identical as well. Any variation on the input document or file will result in a totally different hash value. Hash functions are designed to be one-way, meaning it should be computationally infeasible to reverse the process and obtain the original input from the hash value. The sender applies a mathematical algorithm to a hash of the message using their private key, generating the digital signature. This means to produce a digital signature, the generated hash must go through an asymmetric encryption process. Encryption is a process of converting readable data into an unreadable form using an algorithm and an encryption key. 
The purpose is to protect the confidentiality of the information and make it reversible only by those who have the decryption key. The created digital signature is appended to the message. The user then sends the data with a digital signature along with the signer's digital certificate which contains the public key to the intended receiver. The public key is important because it makes the verification process possible. After receiving the data and signature on it, the receiver feeds the sender's public key and the digital signature into an algorithm. It generates a hash value as output. Additionally, the receiver uses the same function and generates the hash value of the original data. If this generated hash value matches the hash value from the previous step, the receiver gets the assurance that the digital signature is valid and can be confident that the message is unchanged. In case an attacker has access to the data and modifies it, the hash of modified data and output provided by the verification algorithm will not match. Hence, the receiver can safely deny the message assuming that the data integrity has been breached. Anti-malware is a type of software program created to protect information technology systems and individual computers from malicious software or malware. Anti-malware programs scan a computer system to prevent, detect, and remove malware. Anti-malware uses three strategies to protect systems from malicious software. First, signature-based malware detection. It uses a set of known software components and their digital signatures to identify new malicious software. Software vendors develop signatures to detect specific malicious software. The signatures are used to identify previously identified malicious software of the same type and to flag the new software as malware. Second, behavior-based malware detection. It helps computer security professionals more quickly identify, block, and eradicate malware by using an active approach to malware analysis. Behavior-based malware detection works by identifying malicious software by examining how it behaves rather than what it looks like. It's sometimes powered by machine learning algorithms. Third, sandboxing. It is a security feature that can be used in anti-malware to isolate potentially malicious files from the rest of the system. It is often used as a method to filter out potentially malicious files and remove them before they have a chance to do damage. Antivirus and anti-malware are terms that are often used interchangeably. They refer to software designed to protect computer systems from malicious software, but the specific features and capabilities of each may vary. Here's how they are different. In terms of scope, antivirus software focus primarily on detecting and preventing traditional forms of malicious software, such as viruses, worms, and Trojan horses. These types of threats often spread through infected files or attachments. On the other hand, the scope of anti-malware includes a broader range of malicious software beyond traditional viruses. It is a more modern and comprehensive approach to combating various forms of malware, including viruses, worms, spyware, adware, ransomware, and other types of malicious code. The key takeaway is that both antivirus and anti-malware software aim to protect systems from malicious software, and modern solutions often incorporate a variety of techniques to address a broad spectrum of threats. A firewall is a network security device or software that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predetermined security rules. The primary purpose of a firewall is to establish a barrier between a secure internal network and untrusted external networks such as the internet. Firewalls work by inspecting packets of data and determining whether to allow or block them based on the defined rules. When data is transmitted over the network, it is often broken down into smaller packets for efficient and reliable transmission. The process of breaking down data into packets is known as packetization. In networking, a data packet is a fundamental unit of data that is transmitted over a network. It is a formatted unit of data that includes both the actual information being transmitted and control information for routing and managing the data as it travels across the network. This packetization allows for more efficient use of network resources as each packet can take a different route to reach its destination, and it enables error detection and correction. Here's an overview of how firewalls work. Packet filtering. 
firewalls examine individual data packets as they travel between the source and destination. Packets that meet the specified criteria based on established security rule sets are allowed to pass through, while others are blocked. Packet filtering firewalls are divided into two categories, stateless and stateful. Stateless firewalls examine packets independently of one another and lack context, making them easy targets for hackers. In contrast, stateful firewalls remember information about previously passed packets and are considered much more secure. Instead of just inspecting individual packets, stateful firewalls maintain a table of active connections and their states. This allows the firewall to make more informed decisions by considering the state of the communication. While packet filtering firewalls can be effective, they provide very basic protection and can be very limited. For example, they can't determine if the contents of the request that's being sent will adversely affect the application it's reaching. Proxy Firewalls can also act as intermediaries or proxies between clients and servers. The client must send a request to the firewall where it is then evaluated against a set of security rules and then permitted or blocked. If permitted, the firewall forwards requests on behalf of the client and retrieves responses from the server. Firewalls can also use a technique called Network Address Translation or NAT. Firewalls can modify the source or destination IP addresses of packets to hide the internal network structure. NAT firewalls are similar to proxy firewalls in that they act as intermediary between a group of computers and outside traffic. It allows multiple devices with independent network addresses to connect to the internet using a single IP address, keeping individual IP addresses hidden. As a result, attackers scanning a network for IP addresses can't capture specific details, providing greater security against attacks. Firewalls can either be software or hardware, though it's best to have both. Hardware firewalls are appliances placed at the perimeter of the network or network segment as a first line of defense. While a software firewall is a program, sometimes packaged with the operating systems in a home or personal devices, and regulates traffic through port numbers and applications. A hardware firewall in a computer network runs software installed on the hardware appliance, while a software firewall in a computer network uses a computer as the hardware device on which to run. For this reason, software firewalls are often referred to as host firewalls and hardware firewalls as network firewalls. Steganography is a practice of hiding sensitive information within a non-secret file or message so that it will not be detected. Many examples of steganography involve embedding a secret piece of text inside of a picture. The sensitive information will then be extracted from the ordinary file or message at its destination, thus avoiding detection. It's not a form of cryptography because it doesn't involve scrambling data or using a key. Instead, it is a form of data hiding and can be executed in clever ways. The purpose of steganography is to conceal and deceive. It can be used both for constructive and destructive purposes. For example, education and business institutions, intelligence agencies, the military, and certified ethical hackers use steganography to embed confidential messages and information in plain sight. On the other hand, criminal hackers use steganography to corrupt data files or hide malware in otherwise innocent documents. I hope this video clarified information security. If you found it helpful, please like, share, comment, and consider subscribing. Thanks for your time.